from the Voice of America. This is Learning English Weekend. It's Saturday, May 21st. I'm Katie Weaver in Washington, D.C. Today on the podcast, we visit Carlsbad Caverns National Park. And later, we'll hear the classic American story, The Caliph, Cupid, and the Clock, by O. Henry. But now, let's go to France, where the Cannes International Film Festival is taking place. Here's Dorothy Gundy. Several American movies are among the leading candidates for the biggest award at the Cannes Film Festival, the Palme d'Or. Others got booed. The prize for worst reception so far goes to The Last Face, directed by Sean Penn. The movie star, director, political activist, attempts a story about the romantic and humanitarian struggles of two aid workers in Liberia. Some critics wonder why the film centers on their relationship instead of the horrors faced by the local people they are supposed to help. Benjamin Lee of The Guardian Online writes, This is not a film about Penn helping people. It's a film to show how much he wants to be seen helping people. The movie was severely panned on Twitter after its Cannes debut. Tweets describe The Last Face as racist, transcendentally bad, and a chore to sit through. Two American movies are considered strong candidates for the Palme d'Or. Loving from director Jeff Nichols, is based on a true story of two Americans who were sentenced to prison for marrying each other in the 1950s. Mildred and Richard Loving fled Virginia to avoid jail after they were found guilty of violating state law barring interracial marriage. Mildred Loving was black, and Richard Loving was white. The two took legal action against the state of Virginia for its action. They won the case in 1967, when the Supreme Court ruled the law violated the United States Constitution. A joint British-American movie is also on top of some Palme d'Or prediction lists. British filmmaker Andrea Arnold directed the film American Honey. It stars American actors Sasha Lane, Shia LaBeouf, and Riley Keough. Lane stars as a poor Texas teenager with little support or supervision from adults in her life. She meets up with a group of similar teenagers and begins a cross-country trip with them. Critic Eric Cohn of IndieWire praised the film for capturing the explosive sense of liberty that comes with living dangerously. The winning film will receive a prize in a ceremony on the festival's closing day, Sunday, May 22nd. I'm Dorothy Gundy. This week, we explore a national park and UNESCO World Heritage Site in the American Southwest. This national park, near the city of Carlsbad, New Mexico, is unusual in a major way. It is mostly underground. Carlsbad Caverns National Park contains more than 100 caves below the surface of the desert. Most are closed to the public, but anyone can visit the main attraction, one of the largest caves in the world. (laughs) 
huge, incredible, inspiring. Words like these come to mind as visitors enter a world of silence, darkness, and cold, almost 230 meters under the ground. An elevator lowers you into the world of Carlsbad Cavern. It is silent, except for the quiet voices of guides and visitors. It is not fully dark, though. The National Park Service has enough lighting to see many of the beautiful formations all around. The temperature in the cave is about 13 degrees Celsius. A cavern is a large cave. But Carlsbad Cavern is really a long series of chambers. One of these is called the Big Room. The Big Room measures more than three hectares. The ceiling is 77 meters high. The Big Room is the single largest underground chamber ever found in North America. The Big Room and other parts of the cavern contain huge, sharp formations of minerals. People are free to explore the lit formations in the Big Room, but park rangers must guide visitors to other areas of the cave. Stalactites hang from the ceiling. Stalagmites rise from the floor. Some even meet to create a column. Other formations look like needles, popcorn, pearls, and flowers. One of the first questions visitors might have is how did Carlsbad Cavern form? Guides explain that it did not result from the action of waterways like other limestone caves. Its creator was sulfuric acid. The limestone developed about 250 million years ago. Then, within the last 20 million years, movements in the earth pushed the rock upward, forming the Guadalupe Mountains. Today, these mountains extend from west Texas into southeast New Mexico. The action of oil and natural gas created hydrogen sulfide in the limestone. The hydrogen sulfide reacted with oxygen in rainwater moving through the rock. Sulfuric acid developed. The acid created the caves by dissolving the limestone in its path. Later, the water and most of the acid left the caves as the Guadalupe Mountains continued to rise. This permitted fresh water to move through. The fresh water left behind minerals. These minerals became the formations and shapes on the ceilings, walls, and floors of the caves. People are not the only visitors to Carlsbad Caverns National Park. About 400,000 Mexican free-tailed bats come from Mexico every summer to give birth in the big cave. As the sun goes down each day, thousands of adult bats fly out of the cave. It can take from 20 minutes to more than two hours for them all to leave. They go to nearby river valleys to feed on insects. Then, toward morning, they return to the bat cave within Carlsbad Cavern. Park Service rangers explain that mother bats find their babies by remembering their location, their smell, and the sound of their cry. Mothers and their babies, called pups, hang in groups on the ceiling. They spend the day resting and feeding. While the adults go out at night for food, the young bats hang out in the cave for four or five weeks. Then 
in July or August, they join their mothers on these nightly flights. Finally, in late October or early November, the bats all leave and return to Mexico, but they always come back the next year. It is possible that it was the bats that led ancient people to discover the cave. Archaeologists and others have found evidence of Ice Age hunters near the cave entrance. They have also found pieces of spear points left about 10,000 years ago. More recently, Apache Indians painted pictures at the entrance, and evidence of one of their cooking areas was found beside a nearby path. Around 1900, a teenage cowboy named James Larkin White began to explore the cave. Jim White told his story in the 1932 book The Discovery and History of Carlsbad Caverns. Here is a reading of his description of his first sight of the bats and the big cave. I thought it was a volcano, but then I'd never seen a volcano, nor never before had I seen bats swarm, for that matter. During my life on the range, I'd seen plenty of prairie whirlwinds, but this thing didn't move. It remained in one spot, spinning its way upward. I watched it for perhaps a half hour, until my curiosity got the better of me. Then I began investigating. Jim White told how he built a ladder from rope, wire, and sticks, and returned to the entrance of the cave a few days later. Standing at the entrance of the tunnel, I could see ahead of me a darkness so absolutely black it seemed a solid. The light of my lantern was but a sickly glow. Nevertheless, I forged ahead, and with each step the tunnel grew larger, and I felt as though I was wandering into the very core of the Guadalupe Mountains. Several years later, in 1918, Jim White took a professional photographer into the cave. Ray Davis's pictures of the big room appeared in the New York Times newspaper. National interest began to grow. In 1923, scientists from the National Geographic Society explored the caves. The following year, President Calvin Coolidge named Carlsbad a national monument. Presidents can declare national monuments but Congress must act to establish a national park. And that is what Congress did in 1930. Since then, parts of Carlsbad Caverns have been used for movie sets, weddings, even meetings of the Carlsbad City Council. Most visitors go to the main cavern, but some experienced cavers are permitted to explore five wild caves in the park. And in another one, scientists are studying microbes in search of a cure for cancer. As for Jim White, he became chief ranger of Carlsbad Caverns. In one story in his book, he talks about all of the work that was done in the area. I doubt if you can understand how happy this modernizing has made me. It's like the pleasant end to a dream. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Katie Weaver. Now, our American Stories program. The Caliph Cupid 
and the clock. Prince Michael of Valleluna sat in the park on the seat he liked best. In the coolness of the night he felt full of life. The other seats were not filled. Cool weather sends most people home. The moon was rising over the houses on the east side of the park. Children laughed and played. Music came softly from one of the nearer streets. Around the little park, cabs rolled by. The trains that traveled high above the street rushed past. These cabs and trains, with their wild noises, seemed like animals outside the park, but they could not enter. The park was safe and quiet, and above the trees was the great round shining face of a lighted clock in a tall old building. Prince Michael's shoes were old and broken. No shoemaker could ever make them like new again. His clothes were very torn. The hair of his face had been growing for two weeks. It was all colors, gray and brown and red and green-yellow. <laughs> his hat was older and more torn than his shoes and his other clothes. Prince Michael sat on the seat he liked best, and he smiled. It was a happy thought to him that he had enough money to buy every house he could see near the park if he wished. He had as much gold as any rich man in this proud city of New York. He had as many jewels and houses and land. He could have sat at table with kings and queens. All the best things in the world could be his. Art, pleasure, beautiful women, honor. All the sweeter things in life were waiting for Prince Michael of Valleluna, whenever he might choose to take them. But instead, he was choosing to sit in torn clothes on a seat in a park. For he had tasted the fruit of the tree of life. He had not liked the taste. Here in this park, he felt near to the beating heart of the world. He hoped it would help him to forget that taste. These thoughts moved like a dream through the mind of Prince Michael. There was a smile across his face, with its many-colored hair. Sitting like this, in torn clothes, he loved to study other men. He loved to do good things for others. Giving was more pleasant to him than owning all his riches. It was his chief pleasure to help people who were in trouble. He liked to give to people who needed help. He liked to surprise them with princely gifts. But he always gave wisely, after careful thought. And now, as he looked at the shining face of the great clock, his smile changed. The prince always thought big thoughts. When he thought of time, he always felt a touch of sadness. Time controlled the world. People had to do what time commanded. Their comings and goings were always controlled by a clock. They were always in a hurry and always afraid because of time. It made him sad. After a little while, a young man in evening clothes came and sat upon a seat near the prince. For half an hour he sat there, nervously. Then he began to watch the face of the lighted clock above the trees. The prince could see that the young man had a trouble. He could also see that, somehow, the clock was part of the trouble. The prince rose and went to the young man's seat. "'I am a stranger, and I shouldn't speak to you,' he said. "'But I can see that you are troubled. "'I am Prince Michael of Valleluna. "'I do not want people to know who I am. "'That is why I wear these torn clothes. 
It is a small pleasure of mine to help those who need help. First, I must feel sure they are worth helping. I think you are. And perhaps your trouble may be ended if you and I together decide what to do about it. The young man looked up brightly at the prince. Brightly. But he was still troubled. He laughed then. But still the look of trouble remained. But he accepted this chance to talk to someone. I'm glad to meet you, prince, he said pleasantly. Yes, I can see you don't want to be known. That's easy to see. Thanks for your offer to help, but I don't see what you can do. It's my own problem, but thanks. Prince Michael sat down at the young man's side. People often said no to him, but they always said it pleasantly. Clocks, said the prince, are tied to the feet of all men and women. I have seen you watching that clock. That face commands us to act, whether or not we wish to act. Let me tell you not to trust the numbers on that face. They will destroy you if they can. Stop looking at that clock. What does it know about living men and women? I usually don't look at that clock, said the young man. I carry a watch, except when I wear evening clothes. I know men and women as I know the trees and the flowers, said the prince warmly and proudly. I have studied many years, and I am very rich. There are few troubles that I cannot help. I have read what is in your face. I have found honor and goodness there, and trouble. Please accept my help. I can see that you are wise. Show how wise you are. Do not judge me by my torn clothes. I am sure I can help you. The young man looked at the clock again, and his face grew darker. Then he looked at a house beside the park. Lights could be seen in many rooms. Ten minutes before nine. Ten minutes before nine, said the young man. He raised his hands and then let them fall as if hope had gone. He stood up and took a quick step or two away. Remain, commanded Prince Michael. His voice was so powerful that the young man turned quickly. He laughed a little. I'll wait ten minutes and then I'll go, he said in a low voice, as if only to himself. Then to the prince he said, I'll join you. We'll destroy all the clocks, and women too. Sit down, said the prince softly. I do not accept that. I do not include women. Women are enemies of clocks. They are born that way. Therefore, they are friends of those who wish to destroy clocks. If you can trust me, tell me your story. The young man sat down again and laughed loudly. <laughs> ah, prince, I will, he said. He did not believe that Prince Michael was really a prince. His manner of speaking proved that. You see that house, Prince? That house with lights and three windows on the third floor? At six tonight, I was in that house with the young lady I'm going to... was going to marry. I'd been doing wrong, my dear Prince, and she heard about it. I was sorry. I wanted her to forget it. We're always asking women to forget things like that, aren't we, Prince? I want time to think, she said. I will either forget it forever or never see your face again. At half past eight, she said, watch the middle window on the third floor of this house. If I decide to forget, I will hang out a long white cloth. You will know then that everything is as it was before, and you may come to me. If you see nothing hanging from the window... You will know that everything between us is finished, forever. That, said the young man, is why I've been watching that clock. 
The time was past twenty-three minutes ago. Do you see why I'm a little troubled, my torn prince? Let me tell you again, said Prince Michael in his soft voice, that women are the born enemies of clocks. Clocks are bad. Women are good. The white cloth may yet appear. Never, said the young man hopelessly. Eh, you don't know Marion. She is always on time to the minute. That was the first thing I liked about her. At 8.31, I should have known that everything was finished. I'm going to go west. I'll get on the train tonight. I'll find some way to forget her. Good night, Prince. Prince Michael smiled his gentle, understanding smile. He caught the other's arm. The bright light in the prince's eyes was softening. It was dreamlike, clouded. Wait, he said, till the clock tells the hour. I have riches and power, and I'm wiser than most men. But when I hear the clock tell the hour, I'm afraid. Stay with me till then. This woman shall be yours. You have the promise of the Prince of Valleluna. On the day you are married, I will give you one hundred thousand dollars and a great house beside the Hudson River. But there must be no clocks in that house. Do you agree to that? Sure, said the young man. I don't like clocks. He looked again at the clock above the trees. It was three minutes before nine. I think, said Prince Michael, that I will sleep a little. It has been a long day. He lay down on the seat, as if he had often done it before. You'll find me on this park on any evening when the weather is good, said the prince. Come to me when you know the day you'll be married. I'll give you the money. Thanks, prince said the young man. That day isn't going to come, but thanks. Prince Michael fell into a deep sleep. His hat rolled on the ground. The young man lifted it, placed it over the prince's face, and moved one of the prince's legs into an easier position. Poor fellow, he said. He pulled the torn coat together over the prince's body. It was nine. Loud and surprising came the voice of the clock, telling the hour. The young man took a deep breath and turned for one more look at the house. And he gave a shout of joy. From the middle window on the third floor, a snow-white wonderful cloth was hanging. Through the park a man came hurrying home, uh, will you tell me the time, please? asked the young man. The other man took out his watch. Twenty-nine and a half minutes after eight. And then he looked up at the clock. But that clock is wrong, the man said. The first time in ten years. My watch is always... But he was talking to no one. He turned and saw the young man running toward the house with three lighted windows on the third floor. And in the morning, two cops walked through the park. There was only one person to be seen, a man asleep on a long park seat. They stopped to look at him. "'Ish, Michael, a dreamer,' said one. "'He's been sleeping like this in the park for twenty years. "'He won't live much longer, I guess.' The other cop looked at something in the sleeper's hand. "'Look at this,' he said. Fifty dollars! I wish I could have a dream like that. And then they gave Prince Michael of Valleluna a hard shake and brought him out of his dreams and into real life. That's all the time we have today. I'm Katie Weaver. Thanks for joining us on Voice of America Learning English Weekend. <laughs>